Father, thank you so much for your love and your grace in our hearts. Thank you for expressing through the, through the ministry of music and the prophetic words this morning, through your word, reminding us, God, that you see us, you know our needs, and you lovingly care for us, and you want to meet our every need because you are the one thing in our hearts. I just thank you, God, that you've already ministered in this place today, opening eyes, opening ears, opening hearts, helping people to believe and receive all that you have for them. And we thank you, God, for the anointing upon me as I preach your word and upon your people to receive it and be transformed by it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, we've talked about what are we going to focus on in 2024. Hebrews 12, 1, through 1 and 2 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, those saints who have gone on before us, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Can you say that with me? Fixing our eyes on on Jesus. One more time. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him. Do you know who the joy was that was set before him? That's you. That's you. Put your hand on me. You have to say, I'm God's joy. I'm God's joy. The joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. He scorned its shame. He said, I don't care about the shame of the cross. I'm, I'm, I'm going to the cross for that one. And then he sat down at the right hand of God on the throne. We're going to fix our eyes on 2024 on Jesus. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. We're going to seek after one thing. One thing, and that's Jesus. So I was thinking about that this week, one thing, and yesterday, I thought about the, there's, did you know that there's five places in Scripture where that phrase, one thing, is mentioned? And this morning, and that means there's, there were five people who mentioned one thing. And this morning, what I want to do is take you on a real quick journey through these five people and their circumstances of how they wanted to focus on one thing. The first one was found in Psalm 27, verse 4. King David, put it in context. King David the little shepherd boy who played his harp out in the field and worshipped Jesus or worshipped God under the stars in the dark. He'd become a grown man. And at this point, and when he wrote Psalm 27, he was running from his enemy. And we don't know if this was the time when he was running from King Saul because King Saul was pursuing him to, to kill him or if, we, if he was running from his son Absalom who had turned against him and was trying to kill him. But we do know that David was in distress. He was anxious. He was worried. He was possibly fearful. And yet, in the midst of that difficult situation, he penned this psalm. And he says, One thing... One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, 
that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze or behold or fix my eyes on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. David said that he realized there's one thing that's important. And I remember when I was a young lad out there worshiping God, playing my harp, singing to him and my, my spirit soared and I was able to worship him. And here I sit in a cave and I'm fearful. And he's remembering that time when he was a young lad. And he's saying, this one thing, I'm going to speak to my soul and I declare this. One thing, (laughs) one thing, God, when it all comes down to it, when all the dust settles, what's really important is one thing, that I can seek the Lord, that I can gaze upon his beauty, that I can fix my eyes on the Lord. And when we get to that place, all that other stuff begins to calm down, doesn't it? That's the first, that's the first place. David was the first one to say one thing I ask of the Lord and that only do I seek. The second time we find that in Scripture, that's the only time in the Old Testament. The rest, the other four are found in the New Testament. The next one is in Mark chapter 10. Remember the rich young man who came to Jesus? He came. Let's just read that passage of Scripture. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before Jesus. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do? Say, I do. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? Jesus, no one is good except God alone. And you wonder about that passage Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. Do you realize God was giving him an insight that he was God? That's what that really is. You know, have you ever looked at those those pictures? and and, And if you cross your eyes just right, there's a picture that comes out of the picture. And it's like it's hidden right there in plain sight. This passage of scripture, it's like Jesus is hidden in plain sight in front of this rich young man. Why do you call me good? There's no one good except God. Look at me. You're looking at God. That's really what he's saying in this passage of scripture. And then Jesus goes on. He says, you know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your mother and father. So Jesus is laying out the law. The young man declared, teacher, all these I've said, all these I have kept since I was a boy. What is Jesus doing here? He's giving him an opportunity to step outside of his self-righteousness and to understand that none of us can ever keep the law. The Bible says if you fail in one little tiny dot, it's equivalent to failing them all. And Jesus is laying this out for this young man to just look at him and say, well, maybe I didn't honor my mom exactly right that time. Or maybe, maybe, you know, there's a, maybe maybe I did take that pencil from work, right? Jesus is giving an opportunity saying, this word is a mirror that when we read it, And we hold it up, we see that we're not perfect. And then we see the hope of an offering of a Savior that is saying, it's okay. 
because I was perfect. I am perfect. And I paid the price for all of your imperfections. Can you see the love of God in this? We have, we have this tendency to, to look at this a little bit different, right? But it says then that Jesus looked at him and loved him. He loved him. And Jesus then, after looking at him, and you can hear the love in his voice. You can see the love in his eyes. Jesus looked at him and loved him and said to him, one thing you lack. Go and sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come, follow me. And at this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus was giving this man an opportunity of a lifetime to just have his eyes opened up to see. You can't do it on your own. All that that man would have had to say was, gee, Jesus, I can't do it on my own. Could you help me? That's what Jesus was after. Did you know that he's after your, I can't do it on my own? That's what he's after. He's not after you to pull up your bootstraps and tie them real tight and pull up your little girl pants or your little boy pants and say, I can do it. He's after your, I can't. Will you help me? That's what he's after with this young man. That's all he's after. And he goes a little bit deeper. You see, there's just one thing. There's just one more thing. I'm going to give you one more opportunity. One more opportunity. Go sell all you have. In other words, he's putting his finger on the man's prized possessions. What are you holding on to the tightest? That's what he's putting his finger on. He's doing the same thing he did to Abraham when he said to Abraham, take your only son up on the mountain and sacrifice him for me. He put his finger on the one thing that he loved more than the one thing that we are called to fix our eyes on and pursue. He's just putting his finger on the one thing that's standing between him and a total commitment to God. That's all he's doing. And the only reason he does that is because he is love personified. Because anything that stands between us and God separates us from the perfect love that he wants us to have. It's all about love. It's all about love. It's all about the magnitude of the love that he has for us. And he wants to remove everything that stands in the way of love. That's what it's all about. So he's saying... One thing, just one thing. Romans 3, 19, 23 says, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced. The whole world may be held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. That's what he's saying to that rich young man. You can never be good enough. You can never keep the law. What must I do to be saved? What you have to do to be saved is to give up. Just give up. Lord, I'm yours. Save me. I can't. Will you help me? That's what he's looking for. That's what he's looking for. The third one thing that we see is Luke 10, 38, verses 40 down to 42. It's Mary and Martha. Let's read the scripture. Now it happened as they happened as they went. They ent- he entered into a village that would be Bethany. We sing about Bethany, make me a Bethany, right? 
What does that mean? It means makes me a place where Jesus can go and he can find rest. So he entered a certain village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his words. But Martha was distracted. You say distracted? Come on, distracted? How many times are we distracted? But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached Jesus and said, Lord, Lord, do you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Can you hear them see that? And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that part, which will not be taken from her. All my life, I've been a Mary. I've sat at Jesus' feet. That's all I want to do is sit at Jesus' feet and worship him. That's all I've wanted to do. I've thought, well, there, if there's stuff to be cooked in the kitchen and everybody wants to eat, let them fast like I do. Why, why do I have to go cook for them? I'm fasting. <laughs> Yesterday... I really got Martha. I'm, all, I'm, I'm just sitting there and I'm just worshiping. R.C. and I were texting back and forth. All I want to do is cry and worship and praise and cry and worship and praise. But then I've said to Jesus, Jesus, I need a message for tomorrow. There's going to be people that's going to come and they expect me to feed them. Fresh bread. I'm a, I'm a prophetic preacher. I get fresh bread. I give you fresh bread to eat. I don't know if you know that or not. I get fresh bread. I feed you what spirit tells me. And I'm sitting there yesterday. And all I want to do is cry and worship. Cry and worship. And I'm saying, the Martha in me gets up. Looks over at me and goes, you need to get a message for tomorrow. <sighs> And so I said to Jesus, this is wonderful worshiping you, Jesus, but they're going to come tomorrow and they're going to want something more than watching me cry and worship. And you know what he said to me? I fed 5,000 with just five loaves and two fish. What are these? What are you to Jesus? This small group of people in comparison to out on the side of a mountain, he can feed 5,000 people. And if he can feed 5,000 people, then I need to get out of the Martha mode and I need to stay in the Mary mode and I just need to worship him because that's what he wants. The one thing that he was asking of me was to worship him and he could take care of feeding you. Shh. Object lesson. Object lesson for me and for you. One thing Mary chose And then the last, no, there's another one. That was Mary. Oh, there's, there's, there's a fourth one. This is a long passage. It's the entire chapter of John. Would you like for me to read the entire chapter of, book of, of nine, John 9? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do that to you. But there was a man who was born blind. Remember the story? A man that was born blind. 
And Jesus made some mud, put it in his eyes and told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. Now remember, he was a beggar because he was born blind. He went and washed in the pool of Siloam. He came back and he can see. And everybody's talking about, who is this guy? I'm the one that was begging over there. No, he, you, you, you can see. There's a, there's a big conversation that's going on. And the Pharisees hear about this conversation. And he goes in among them. And the Pharisees are demanding, how can you see? We don't know if it's really you. Call your parents. You know, and they're quizzing him. And then it gets down to the bottom line. They realize that he's declaring that Jesus is the one who healed him. And he said, the Pharisees say, don't you know that that Jesus is a sinner? And this man's response was this. Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know, once I was blind, but now I see. One thing. That's just one thing I do know. One thing I do know, I had a need, but Jesus met it. One thing I do know, I was lost in sin, but today my heart is pure. One thing I do know, I was bound up and fearful and worried But today, one thing I do know, today, after I met Jesus, I have peace in my heart. How many of you can say that? I was a mess, and now I'm not a mess in some areas of my life. (laughs) One thing I know, I was blind But now I see. And then Jesus approached this man after he'd been with the Pharisees. And Jesus said to him, do you know who I, do do you believe in the son of God? And the man said, "I, I don't even know who that is. And Jesus said, I am he. And the man said, I believe. And he followed Jesus. Smart man. Amen. Smart man. And then we have one left, one left, the number five. Philippians chapter three. Let's put it in context. Here we are, the apostle Paul, who wrote the, most of the epistles in the New Testament. Let's look at the passage of scripture. He is, he is, Dealing with people who want to come in again and teach the law, the Pharisees. They're trying to get people to to follow after the law rather than trusting in the grace that comes to us through Jesus Christ. We still have that today. There is one way. And it is through the cross and through what Jesus did for us. Never about what we can do for him. Amen. So we say, Paul Paul is saying, to refute them, this is what Paul is saying. This is his testimony. He's saying, I was circumcised. If anybody has any right to be proud of who they are and being able to be a religious Pharisee and follow after all of this legal stuff that you're talking about, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I am of the stock of Israel. I am of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. Concerning the law, I'm a Pharisee. I was a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. Concerning righteousness, which is in the law, I was blameless. So if these Pharisees have something, they don't have anything on me, Paul's saying. But then he goes on. But what things were gained to me, I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellency 
of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. I have suffered the loss of all things, Paul says, and I count everything as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him. Can you say that with me? That I may know him. Say one more time. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. His response here is the exact opposite of the rich young man. Paul, the apostle Paul is saying, I count everything loss. I gave it all up, all my credentials. I'm keeping the commandments that he, the, the rich young man said, I kept them all. And Paul is saying, I was as righteous as they come. But I counted that as loss. The rich young man turns away because he's got so much wealth. The apostle Paul is saying, I laid it all down. I walked away from everything. I, I, it's, all, it's all like a pile of manure to me in comparison to following Jesus. See the contrast? I believe that that rich young man was receiving the same invitation that the apostle Paul received. Lay it all down. Give it all up. Put me first. Let me be the one thing that you seek after. Lay down your self-righteousness. Come follow me. Jesus invited him to come follow me. But he walked away. I believe it's the same invitation that the Apostle Paul gave. I believe it's the same invitation that's going out today. He wants us to lay it all down. He wants us to realize it's all done. It's all a pile of manure. All of the credentials that we have, everything that we've done, every, 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 all the degrees that we have on our wall, and I have some. It's all absolutely nothing. We count it all rubbish so that we can go after the one thing. When Bruce and I, God called Bruce and I to the mission field. I mean, I had just left my job as a director of cardiology. Bruce and four, th through other guys owned the four Taco John stores here in town. We sold it all. We sold our house. We sold our three cars. Every bit of our furniture, we walked off from it all. With two suitcases each. And we went to the mission field. I know what it's like to give it up because it really is just stuff. It really is. And when I can't tell you, when we let go of all that stuff, I felt like I'd been unchained from a doghouse. We got comfortable in China. We got nested there, and then the Lord called us to the Philippines. We couldn't take anything to the Philippines with us. We, we'd walk away from everything again with a couple suitcases. Same thing from the Philippines back to the United States. Lay it down. Give it up. It's not worth it. There's one thing. There's one thing that he wants of us. Now, that doesn't mean he's not going to give us stuff. He knows what. He just gave us that passage of scripture. The lilies of the field. I know you need clothes. I know you need shelter. I know you need food. I know you have all of those needs. But I want to be your provider. I love you with a love beyond anything you can ever comprehend. And if you will let me be the one, I will give you more than you can imagine. And then Paul goes on with his scripture. We're ending with this. Paul says, brethren, 
Brothers and sisters, I do not count myself to have apprehended or attained all these things. But one thing, one thing, Paul says, I do. And that's forgetting all those things which are behind me. And I reach towards those things which are ahead of me. And I press towards the goal for the prize of the high and upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's it. It's all about him. He's the one thing. He's the one thing that our hearts seek after. Stephen Covey has an example. Putting in the, he says, if you, you have this bucket, you've got a big rock and gravel and sand. If you put the sand in first and then the gravel, you'll never get the big rock in. It just won't fit. But if you put the one thing, the big thing in the bucket first, and then you put the gravel in, and then you can put the sand in, it'll all fit. Jesus is the one thing. He has to go in our bucket first. We have to seek him first. And if we will seek him first, like I did yesterday, he'll give you bread to eat. Do you think this is a good meal? Jesus just fed you. He's the one thing. He's the one thing. You have David. He said, one thing will I seek after. The rich young man Jesus wanted invited him. Mary chose the one thing. The blind man. The one thing. He laid it all down and followed after Jesus, the apostle Paul. One thing. Five people. Five examples. Surely one of these today, God has spoken to your heart. And you have identified with one of them. For me, it was Mary and Martha. I had to lay down my Martha and hang on to Mary yesterday and trust Jesus to feed you today. I surrender all, I surrender all, all to Jesus, blessed Savior, I surrender all. That's what he wants. what he wants he wants our heart he wants our love he wants our affections to be untangled from the affections of this world he wants us to be willing And sometimes you have to look at him and say, Jesus, I just can't. I don't know how to do this. I, I, I want to. I, wa I really want to, but I don't know how to do it. I really want to, but it's just really difficult for me right now. All he wants you to say is, I'm willing. He just wants your yes. And then he will help you disconnect. He will help you get your focus. He will help you like he was willing to do with the rich young man. You are all I need. You are all I need. Jesus, 
you're all I need. Jesus. There's an invitation today. That Jesus is saying, will you make me the one thing that you set your affections on for 2024? In all your weakness, in all your frailty, in all your burden, in all your Martha busyness, and with all the worries and the family that you have, and all of the stuff that's going on, all these plates that you have to spin to keep life going with the grandkids and with and with working and and with school and with all of these things that's going on in your life will you just say yes to me as the one thing will you just say yes would you just pray this prayer along with me God, I can never be good enough. You're the only one that's good. God, I cannot, but you can. Would you save me? I'm yours. Would you save me? I'm yours. I believe in Jesus. I believe he died. I believe he rose from the dead. And I place the weight of my trust in Jesus to make me right and to give me eternal life. I have no other plan but to place my faith and my trust in you. I look to you. I fix my eyes on you. I want you to be the one thing in my life that I run after. I want to run towards you. I want you to be the passion of my heart. Save me, Jesus. I'm yours.